Welcome to C++ for Java Programmers. I'm Professor Kalo. In this video, I'm going to introduce pointers and talk about how they're related to references and to arrays. So I want to start out by reminding you about references in Java. So in Java, we have two kinds of variables, primitive variables and object reference variables. So let's remind ourselves of how those work in memory. So here I have a diagram of memory, and we have three primitive variables. We have numLives, which is currently 3, height is 2.5, grade is A. And then I have a savings account that just has a couple of variables. But the account to variable itself contains a memory address, which is the address for an actual object that contains the data for the account. And that's always the case with references. So when we try to actually access account two, it will immediately send us off to see the data in account two. Assume that we then create two new variables, an int my lives that I'm going to assign to num lives, and a savings account, account four, that I'm going to assign account two. Now if we look back at our image of memory, my lives has a copy of the three from num lives. But account four has a copy of the address from account two. Both of these point to the same object. And if I modify my lives and modify account four by depositing $200 into the account, I'm going to see that my lives changed. Num lives did not because it was just a copy of the value that we changed. But the actual object that's pointed at by both account two and account four was modified because these are just references for the actual object. So with that in mind, let's start thinking about C++. First of all, C++ doesn't distinguish between the variable types. Whatever type of variable you have, you can put it on the stack, basically have it be like num lives or my lives that we get a copy of the whole thing. We can do that with objects. We can do it with strings, which of course are a kind of object. We can do it with ints, doubles, etc., just like we do it in Java. Any kind of variable can have a reference. So I can pass an int by reference and I end up with a reference to an int in that new function doesn't have to be an object. Any kind of variable can also have a pointer, which of course is a variable type that Java doesn't have and what we're interested in learning something about here. References are not used very much in C++, so they're heavily, heavily used in Java. In C++, they're not used much as the variable type. In a lot of the places where we would see references in Java, we will actually see pointers and in some cases, we'll see just basic variables on the stack. References are primarily going to be used for us for the parameter passing that we've already talked about. So then, what are these pointer things? Well, they are similar to references in several ways. Their value is a memory address. If I say pointer one is assigned pointer two, and these are both pointers to the same kind of thing, what will be copied is the address. If I say pointer one equals pointer two, what will be compared is the two addresses. Pointers are also what we're going to get in C++ when we dynamically allocate memory using new, which we'll talk about in the next video. Pointers are, however, quite different from references as well. With pointers, we can actually see and manipulate the memory address. With a reference, we can never do that. We always go straight from the reference to the thing it's referring to. With a pointer, we have to explicitly dereference the pointer to get to what it is pointing at. And we can play with the actual memory address in the pointer. So what do pointers look like? Well, here's an example of declaring some pointers. I have a pointer to an int called p, a pointer to an int called q, a pointer to a care called stir, a pointer to a student object called stu pointer. Now, things to note here, if I have multiple variables declared, I have to include the star on each one. If I just said int star p comma q, 
Q would be an int, only P would be a pointer to an int. However, despite that, the asterisk is considered to be part of the type name, not part of the variable name. Pointer values are typically not going to be initialized for you. The size of the pointer is going to be very dependent on the machine architecture, because this is a memory address. So if you're in a 32-bit architecture, then your pointers are going to be 4 bytes. They're going to be 32 bits. If you're in a 64-bit architecture, your pointers are typically going to be 8 bytes, or 64 bits. In many, many cases, longs and pointers will have the same size, but you want to make sure that's true before you start depending on it, because longs are not always the same size as the memory address for the architecture. Another operator that it can be useful for us to be aware of as we're dealing with pointers is the address operator. It's written with an ampersand, and what it does is it actually tells you what the address in memory is of the item that it appears before. So here I've declared an int v and a pointer to an int, ptr, a double x and a pointer to a double y. So what I'm doing to get a value into this pointer variable is getting the address of the v variable, which is of course a valid value. Here I'm getting the address of the x value and or the x variable and storing it in y. So this is not a common approach for getting a value into a pointer, but sometimes it's very useful to be able to just find out where is this located anyway. It can be good for debugging among other things. Now if we're going to use pointers, we do want to get at the values they point at. And as I mentioned, we have to explicitly dereference them. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to use that same asterisk, but put it before the pointer variable. So here I say my val is assigned star pointer. So what that's going to do is copy whatever value pointer is pointing at and store it into the my val variable. You do, anytime you're going to dereference a pointer, you want to make sure that that pointer has a legitimate value. You have a real risk of crashing your program if it doesn't. And you're somewhat familiar with that notion if you've been doing a lot of programming in Java, this little thing called a null pointer exception. So we don't get an exception for that in C++. Uh, if you're in Linux or Unix, you're likely to see the words segmentation fault, which basically is just the computer's way of saying, uh, that memory, you weren't allowed to access that memory. It doesn't belong to you. You're done. If you're working in some other environments, you may see a different phrasing of the error, but basically what's happening is you're accessing a memory that doesn't belong to you, you're going to crash. Now there may be cases where you access a pointer that happens to point at an address that is within your memory space, and you can get some weird behaviors instead, or even have something work because where you were writing on memory didn't matter, or the memory that you tried to read, it was okay. However, we want to be really, really careful that our pointers have legitimate values. And for that reason, of course, we do have a null value. Now notice dereferencing the null value, as with Java, very bad. Zero belongs to the system. Computers don't like us reading or writing systems memory. One thing worth noting is that null gets written a couple of different ways in C++. So the sort of old-fashioned way to do it was all caps null. These days it's much more common to use this null pointer in all lowercase. Uh, so I recommend using that, but I may use the all caps null sum because I've been doing this long before null pointer existed. Both, of course, are just the pointer that is the memory address zero, just exactly the same as our all lowercase null in Java. Okay, let's do some experimenting with this so that we can actually see some of what's going on. So what I've done here 
is I've created a pointer experiments with some of the code that we've been looking at. So um, I have the V and the pointer, the X and the Y set pointer to be pointing at V. So it's gotten the address of V. Y similarly has the address of X. I'm going to set V to 5 and X to 1.2. And then I want to print out the address. So the actual value of pointer show that we can do that. And then I'm going to print out what pointer is pointing at. And we'll do the same for Y. Print out its address and then what it's pointing at. Then I'm going to change the value of the thing pointer is pointing at and then print out v, which should of course be the same thing, so it should now be 7. So let's see how that works. Okay, so our results, and I'll bring the program back up so we can sort of see what we're printing. So we printed the value of pointer, which should be the address where v is. We printed the value pointer is pointing at, which is 5, as we had hoped. Same for y, we print the address and then the value. Then, of course, we modified the value pointer was pointing at, and we printed v, and in fact, we got 7. Now notice these addresses are quite close to each other. We would expect that to be true because they're local variables here in the same place. Um, might also be interesting to actually print out the addresses of the pointer variables, and we can certainly do that. So let's see where they are. And you can see all of them are quite close together here. Not necessarily in the order we would have expected them to be in. Though actually in this case, I think they may be in the order we would expect them to be in. The V, then the pointer, then Y, then X. So actually makes sense in that respect. They didn't reorder our variables for us. Okay, well, we'll be back here in a minute to look at some other things. But let's move on here and talk for just a minute about pointers and arrays. So an array name is really just a constant pointer, where the value of the array is the address of the first element in the array. So let's come back over and take a look at that in code. So, actually have some code down here that I'm just going to pull up and then explain. So here I've declared a score array 10. Then I've created a score pointer that I've given that value score array. Then I've set the thing score pointer is pointing at to 10. I can also do score array at 1 is 12. That shouldn't surprise you at all. Score array is an array. But I can also do score pointer at 2 is 11. And I can do score array plus 3 and then dereference that and make that 40. So let's do all that and see what ends up printing out here when we print the first four elements in score array. Better save that. And we'll recompile and run. Okay, so let's take a look at this. We said star score pointer is 10. 
So score pointer and score array are just pointing at the first element in the array. They're just pointers pointing at that first element. Then here, score array at 1 gets 12, so it doesn't surprise us at all that that was 12. Then we have score pointer at 2 is 11, which worked. Then I have the score array plus 3 dereferenced. And that did put that into that fourth slot. So here's what's going on. What happens with arrays is that we get to the spot where the index is by adding the size of the variable, whatever the type is in the array, times the index to the base value, to the memory address stored in the array variable. So here, score array and score pointer are both memory addresses, pointers, with this value in them right here. The size of an int here is four bytes. So the next item is right here at four more. The next item is eight more. The next item is 12 more. Working in hex, C is a 12. Now, the reason this works is pointer arithmetic works the same way. When we add one to a pointer, we add the size of the type. So let's see what happens if we actually change this. So instead of being ints, which are four apart, it was actually shorts, which would be two apart because each of them would only be two bytes. Now we see that happens. We could do the same sort of thing by uh, turning them into doubles. So a double should be eight bytes. So what's going on here is that we are adding one that means one of the size of this type. So just as an array would need to multiply the index by the size of the type to compute where things are, we do pointer arithmetic, it multiplies the amount we add by the size of the type. And here we can see that this pointer arithmetic thing and memory addresses are very closely related. Should also help you know why modern languages tend to like zero based arrays. It simplifies the arithmetic quite a bit in computing where an element is from its index because we're taking zero plus the index times the size of the type. So just to reiterate, adding one to a pointer changes the memory address by the size of the target type. Adding three to a pointer changes the memory address by three times the size of the target type. And for any array, air, air at i, is exactly the same as dereferencing that pointer, air, plus i. Well, hopefully this has given you a little bit better sense of what pointers are all about. In the next video, I want to actually start delving into what we really do with pointers, which is, of course, to manage dynamic memory. Thanks for watching.